Pastor Jeff, we're in a new series, Marked for Life, and... Um, nice jacket. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay. trying to... They're telling me I have to... Aren't you a little hot, though? You got the hoodie, and then you got the... Uh, yeah, the yes and no. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's more about style than right. comfort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that's exactly. the difference between your generation and mine. <laughs> yeah. We're about comfort. <laughs> I mean, I am too. I'm I'm the oddball of, of uh, my generation. Uh, yeah, yeah. I that mean, might be a good thing. I think so. Yeah. So far, <laughs> and based on your sermon, yeah, the, I think absolutely. So. <laughs> I think so. Um, but yeah, Mark for Life. Uh, you definitely just gave us a lot. Yeah. Um, but really, really good stuff. Um, and I, I just want to talk about Matthew 24, um, which is the text that you preached on. And why is that? Why is it such a text that is hard? For yeah. us to understand, and yeah. I don't know, just that, yeah. Why is it preached differently too? Yeah, yeah, oh, and that's a good point. It is. Uh-huh. I mean, there would be some people who heard that message and probably would be so angry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not angry, but say, so. "What? What are you talking yeah. about?" Well, I think part of the issue is that uh, again, Matthew writes to a Jewish audience, but Jesus seems to. Well, we know, we know with certainty that he goes back and forth between ages. Mm. The end of the age, the end of time, mm. and then the end of the Messianic age, the end of the disciples' yeah. time. And uh, when he mentions the abomination of desolation that mm. Matt, that Daniel talked about, that w- w- Titus comes in. We know now Titus comes in in AD 70 and sacks the city of Jerusalem. And there was a lot of, I mean, it was death and devastation mm. of, that, that had not been seen like that, mm. uh, at least in their day, in their time. So what what happens is because Jesus goes back and forth, you tend to interpret Matthew 24 on the basis of your preferred view of eschatology. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so if you're a premillennialist, you're going to fit it into that. If you're amillennialist, if you're post, if you're mid, you yeah. try to fit it in. And that that's basically what all of us are guilty of that to some degree because we're, it's 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 very difficult. Yeah. Now, let me say something. It's important to know that the overall theme is clear. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, what is the overall theme is be ready. Watch right. your back. You're going to have false teachers. Where, where, yeah. When they come, you're going to have earthquakes, you're going to have floods, famines. So it's not like Jesus is given some secret code to where if you don't figure it out, you're going to lose your salvation. Right. <laughs> you know, so the it, it's just the, 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 the way I tend to lean on all mm-hmm. apocalyptic literature mm-hmm. is what would the people Jesus was talking to at the time thought about what he was saying. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that's why when I go to the book of Revelation, I'm not trying to figure out where China and Russia play in. I'm trying to figure out what would John's readers, as he wrote from the Isle of Patmos, have thought about the signs and symbols because they right. all, without fail, have Old Testament mm. uh, uh, foundation or background. Right. So if you, the more you study the Old Testament, Revelation is going to be simpler. Mm. It, really, it is. Yeah. It's, oh, okay, I got it. Apocalyptic literature is is simply to... It's a literature that, it's it's a genre. It communicates things through signs and symbols figuratively rather than literally. Although right. to say that nothing in Revelation is literal is ridiculous right. because <laughs> that would mean that the return of Christ is figurative, and it's mm-hmm. not. But we know that because of the Gospels. So yeah. you, anytime you interpret apocalyptic literature, you have to take the whole of the Bible. And if you get stuck in a particular end times view, you, you're, it's going to be difficult. Mm-hmm. I try to avoid that as best I can, yeah. which is why when I come to Matthew 24, and I think most, here's where we would agree, that Jesus is making reference to the Messianic era mm-hmm. and the church age era and the end times. Yeah. So we're trying to fit in what he's talking about refers to the Messianic age, the disciples. Yeah. What he's talking about refers to the end times. And the only reason we can figure that out now is because we have other books of the Bible. Mm-hmm. You think about what the disciples would have been hearing. They're thinking through one lens, and that is the lens of, what are the things that are going to happen in our age? Mm-hmm. When does the age end? What are the signs? Yeah. And when is the when is the time of your coming? Because mm-hmm. they get he's going to return mm-hmm. to some degree, but how much of that we don't know. Yeah. Uh, so they get he's going to and they and, and are they in his return? Are they still thinking that he's going to overthrow the Roman Empire and take up mm-hmm. the throne? So because we don't know everything that's in their mind. We can only know some. We have to assume that Jesus is addressing more specifically what's going on in their day and time. Right. Because we, because in retrospect, we can look back at history at what happened. Some of that becomes clear, like the abomination of desolation right. when Titus 
in AD 70 goes into the temple and desecrates the temple. Yeah. Uh, there, there, are different, uh, there are different views of some of the text, but the overall general application and teaching is the same. Mm. There are going to be false teachers. Yeah. There are, are going to be, there's going to be times of persecution. Yeah. There's, the world is not going to get better mm. as far as the evil that happens in our world. It's always going to be present. Yeah. There are two kingdoms diametrically opposed to each other. Those kingdoms are always going to be there. Mm -hmm. And Christ's followers' job is to, rather than to, to take over the evil kingdom, is to pull people out of it mm. uh, into the kingdom of God that yeah. is here but not yet. Right. It's here in form. It's mm -hmm. here in the hearts and minds of believers, and it's here in community. Mm -hmm. But it's not a full reality until the second coming. So those messages are all the same. The timing mm -hmm. of when everything happens is what's up for discussion and debate. And if we didn't have that, what could we talk about? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I chose exactly. Matthew 24, not, not to say that my particular bent of uh, apocalyptic literature is the one you should go with. Mm, mm. But I chose it because there's too much good information about the types of things that are going to be happening right. before Jesus returns. Yeah. And we need to know what those are. Correct. Because the parables he tells, I kind of look at it as Jesus' last words. So mm. Jesus tells a few parables near the end of his ministry before the crucifixion. Yeah. To me, it's like, hey, I've given you all this great information. You got to beware. Mm -hmm. And he tells three very powerful parables that tell us these are the kinds of things that Christ followers will be doing when I do return. Yeah. They'll be busy about this. Right. 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 Yeah. I think, um, one, well, there's a lot to that as well. Yeah. But uh, I think it's important, especially as a church, to uh, this is how I feel like after listening to all that is that we're in the church age trying to be at the end age yeah. and we're focusing way too, too much, much on, the on end that, age. That's exactly that we don't exactly what you said of pulling people out of the evil kingdom out of this world yeah. into god's kingdom yeah. and we this is how i feel and and you could disagree or not but i feel like we reverse that here in the, in the church of the West, is that we are trying to take back the world when jesus is like that's not what I've called you to do. Yeah, I'm quite surprised. We, this seems to come up a lot when mm -hmm. you and I talk, and I think because a couple things. Number one, I don't know where it is that the church suddenly in the West thought its job was to was to occupy politics. Right, right, yeah. yeah. That we're, to the point, now obviously, do we want Christ followers leading our country? Well, of course we do. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course. Does that yeah. mean that I'm anti-Christian right, right. influence in government? Well, that's ridiculous. Of mm -hmm. course, I'm pro that. Mm -hmm. But it, but you you're not if if you align yourself mm -hmm. with anything other than the kingdom of God, then your identity is going to be in that. Yeah. And the problem with that is it's made up of men and women who are flawed. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, the church is flawed as well. And we talk about the the gospel of grace yeah. and mercy. But I just it, it bothers me a little bit when people equate mm -hmm. the kingdom of God and our citizenship in heaven. Yeah with a political party and our citizenship in that. Yeah, I'm yeah, thinking, yeah. okay, I understand that you want to do what's right and you're trying, and as, you know, as long as you're fighting for what's right, as long mm -hmm. as you're, you're protecting the rights of the innocent, as long as yeah. you're doing things like, those are biblical things. Those aren't, just because they've become political things doesn't mean they're political things. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we are told that we are supposed to protect the rights of the innocent. We're, we're mm -hmm. supposed to take care of the poor, those yeah. in poverty. We're supposed to, and not be enablers at the same mm -hmm. time, uh, you know. I mean, it's it's being a Christian is a tough, it's a tough life to live for sure. Yeah. But make no mistake, our citizenship is in heaven, and yep. we eagerly await a savior from there. In the meantime, yeah. we're trying to pull people out of a world system that is flawed and going toward the evil one. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said when I vote. I don't vote for the righteous party. I vote for the lesser of two evils. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, you know. So. <laughs> so. Because they're, it's flawed. Yeah. And yeah, that's, yeah. that would be true in any country. Mm -hmm. That would be true in any place. Right. My hope is not in this world. And, and my hope, this that goes back to the Chuck Colson quote, who was mm -hmm. in politics for many yeah. years, who said, our hope is not in this world. Our hope yeah. is not in government. Our, if we're waiting for government to save us, if we're waiting for some political activity to save us, it's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah. The world is the world. It's always going to be the world. And it's held under the sway of the evil one. Mm -hmm. Our job is to pull people out of that world. Yeah. Recognizing there's a there's a the cosmo creator a world ruler pull out from under that and live distinguished lives in mm -hmm. a new community yeah. yeah to be of the world but 
to be in the world, but not of the world. Right, correct. Uh, it doesn't impact us yeah. to the degree. So that, it, and that's why we don't get so, that's why when we hear the bad news all the time, I mean, man, if you listen to news every day for a while, you'll get depressed. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. But that, you know, we, we care, we pray, we're yeah. concerned, but it doesn't, it doesn't shift and change our, right. our, our it should not change our, our demeanor because mm-hmm. our hope mm-hmm. is never in it. So if your hope's not in something, yeah. What, if it goes up and down, you're sad, but it doesn't last very long. Right. In that sense, mm-hmm. we live above our circumstances mm-hmm. in, right. in that sense. But we are not, as I said, triumphalist where we think yeah. that that uh, we we are immune to the to pain and suffering and persecution. We're mm-hmm. not. And my concern is as is, is it becomes more and more difficult for Christ followers to do business in this world, yeah. and it will be, mm-hmm. you're going to hear more and more of a, People losing their job because yeah. they are Christians. You're going to hear right. more than that. You're going to hear more and more people losing their jobs because they hold a certain political view mm. that is consistent with their Christian faith. Right. Even if they don't push it on people, just the yeah. fact they hold it, yeah. they'll. You're going to hear more and more of that. Right. And so that shouldn't surprise us. Mm-hmm. Right. Should not surprise us because of Matthew 28 because and Matthew literally 28. Jesus. I think with all that you're saying, Jesus is telling us the warnings of saying this is going to happen to you no matter now, obviously he's talking in that moment um but it obviously applies to us today because we do live in a broken world yeah. and we are still waiting for jesus and so, when, when i was younger i always wondered well why why warn us why not just <laughs> why not protect us yeah why not put a a circle around the elect or your christ followers mm-hmm. and protect them from all of that yeah and, and the the bottom line is like I said, delayed justice is not the same thing as no justice. Right. The time is coming mm-hmm. when justice will be will run rampant. It will yeah. roll like a river. In the meantime, what we're asked to do is, is go out into the world and say there's another way, there's a better way, and yeah. live lives of distinction. Right. And I think it goes back to what I tried to, to develop in the message. There is part of God's plan seems to be to allow these types of things to happen in order that the world may be able to, to distinguish between the two kingdoms more clearly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you should be able to say, you know, that is de- death and devastation. That is yeah. not the kingdom I want to be part of. Yeah. And you began to look for answers to kingdoms that last. And mm-hmm. that's supposed to turn you toward Christ. That's hard for us to imagine because, eh, you know, God, you're going to, I mean, there's some pretty bad things that happen in the world. And right. you're telling me that you're going to, you're going to allow those to happen so that the cream can rise to the top mm-hmm. so that you can distinguish between the two kingdoms. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's so, it's, that's very difficult to know how much God allows, what he determines, what he deters. Because yeah. as I've said before, as bad as the world is, you have no idea how many times God does put up mm-hmm. his hand and say this far, no further. No, we're not going there. Right. And it, that, that could be said of the Holocaust even. Mm-hmm. Right. Even as many of people died, many were spared. Yeah. I mean, that's hard for us to fathom. Mm-hmm. And I would like to remind people, God was not the cause of the Holocaust. <laughs> right. And there's and even in that, there's there's so much good that happened in the lives of people. But it is it an evil thing? Oh, it's devastating. You know, it's terrible. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah. And I've struggled with that. I'm not, I mean, yeah. to think that I haven't said, God, you know, I would have put my hand up a little bit sooner. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of death and devastation there. Right. And I have to remember, well, number one, I'm not God. Number mm-hmm. two, evil runs rampant. Number two, number three, God allows free will creatures to express themselves. Mm-hmm. That the only way God could remove any potential of a Holocaust mm-hmm. is to remove all freedom. Yeah. And to remove all freedom would be remove all possibility of love, yeah. which is the reason we were created in the first place. So it's not, it's complex. Yeah. Oh, for and sure. And I don't mean to sound heartless, believe me. Yeah. If I would have lost my fam, my entire family in some kind of persecution or concentration camp, I think the devastation would last. Right. And that's why we're told that we do mourn. We just don't mourn as people without hope. Yeah, right. That's the, we, we do mourn. Right, exactly. And I feel like that kind of goes into Jesus' crucifixion of truly understanding God's love for us mm. is that he did send his son. Yeah. And if that didn't happen, then we would never understand the depths of that love, which is hard for us to hear because it does mean that we have to go through things that may seem unbearable, but it is bearable through Christ. Um, and, it, and it proves that God can accomplish some of his greatest things through our pain and suffering. Yeah, and exactly. The greatest thing ever accomplished in humanity was the death of his son. Mm-hmm. Right. It provided salvation for many. It's That's a hard life to live. And I, yeah. I, that's why I quoted the verse in First Corinthians 13. One day mm-hmm. we will see faith. Yeah. One day we'll connect the dots. And when we yeah. do, evidently, we'll think, oh, oh. Right. And if you comp- And that's why... 
Paul talks about the weight of glory. Mm -hmm. If you contrast mm -hmm. and compare what we are endure here with what will one day be, one day we'll look back and think, man, that, okay, it was painful, but that's nothing compared to the weight right. of glory right. and what I'm experiencing here. And so I try to, you know, I, I try to think of being reunited with my mom, you know, mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. dad. Yeah. What's that going to feel like? Man? Right, right. What's that kind of, I mean, you can't really imagine yeah. what that would be like. You you think about it; it's almost like a dream that it will never come true. Right. And yet, that's that's exactly what will happen. What mm. will that be like? What will it be like to for people who never were able to walk to run? For people yeah. who could never see to have sight. Mm. You, whew. right? Yeah. What's what's five billion years of uh, of of pleasure and ecstasy mm. and, and and full community and unity and love? compared to 72 years <laughs> right, of right. whatever we endure here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I feel like that's the the mission and the goal of preaching the gospel is to tell that person who's going through stuff like that, of, of either losing a loved one or just going through a tragedy, being persecuted, but yet still saying, but because of the love of the Father, we we will get to see this in the end for eternity. We will get restoration in certain things um, that you thought were deemed unredeemable he sees as redeemable yeah, yeah. and i think that's so powerful especially going from your message of of persecution and what we what we go through here on earth as christ followers um is huge i, I think of you spoke on this well, uh, what was the conference that you did a few like probably like six years back and in orange county north american christian yes Division, yeah, yeah. yeah and you talked about oh i don't remember his name but he was starting an underground church, and then he was persecuted. He was like in prison and yeah, tortured. he was actually present. Joseph Na yeah. Nazarala. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, he actually yeah, yeah. stood at the World Towers. Yeah, after they after they were crushed, he yeah. stood there and gave a message of of the gospel. Yeah, and how uh, the two kingdoms are yeah. opposed, and we should not be surprised at evil in the world. Yeah, I right. remember that. Yeah. Joseph Nazarala. Yeah, yeah, that's who it Egyptian. was. Egyptian. Uh huh. And now as part of uh, one of the largest churches in that part of the world, yeah. underground church. Yeah, Great which, story. Is, which uh, is wild. Makadam. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, uh, You yeah, can yeah. actually Google that and see it's it's a rock formation underground, yeah. 30,000 people yeah. attend. Yeah, which is it's absolutely crazy. crazy. But to see the fruit of that, you have to understand what he went through. Yeah. I mean, he went through mm. some some crazy persecution. Yeah. And it, it's, it's interesting that in most parts of the world where that persecution is heavy, it doesn't deter belief. No, right. Right, right. So, so I, that, that's why I say the persecution that we're facing right now, in a way, it's not severe enough yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Man, you know, don't bring it. I'm not saying bring it on, but it's right. not what we face is minimal compared to 330 million people in our world. Right. Uh, and and hope and pray it will never get to that point. Yeah. Yes, but the, of course, the point but... I'm making is when it does get to that point, it sifts the wheat and the tares. Right. Yeah. yeah exactly. And you know, but and I've often wondered why. Why you know, God, yeah. it's not like God needs to know the difference. He already does. <laughs> right. It's almost like we do. Uh -huh. We oh, know what, it look, what the genuine, authentic article looks like. Yeah. And that it matters how we live. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And to even go back with like persecution, the way I think of it is that uh, there's just people online that love to just say things about Christianity oh, or attack yeah. certain people. Oh, yeah. And then those those Christians who are getting attacked or whatever, yeah. they're like, you know, this is the persecution, you know, at its finest. This is, you know, but I'm doing it for Christ. And you're just kind of like, uh, no, no, you just log off. Yeah. Like, just, just yeah. don't look at your computer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so I feel like we even have a, a, a misunderstanding of what persecution yeah. really looks like. Yeah, you don't want to, you, my, you never want to engage online. Right. Because yeah. you have so many people who troll and mm -hmm. then you have so many people who just, they, they don't really believe what they say. They just leave, like to see how far they can go. Right, exactly. And get you riled up. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. there's no use doing that. If it, most of our conversations, in my opinion, conversations should never happen over email or text. Yeah. It should always happen in person. Yeah, oh, 100%. Body language, mm. the care and concern. It's, yeah. it's hard to read tone in words. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's, that's you're right. That's, we, yeah, persecution is <laughs> not, not quite what you yeah. but, but the reality that it's happening in significant. Correct. Uh, to significant degrees all around the world, it is happening. Yeah. Pastors up in the northern part, regions of India, who are trying to take the gospel into places like uh, Bangladesh, uh, Bangalore, mm -hmm. Nepal, Afghanistan, Pakistan, suffer yeah. and die every day. Yeah. 
uh, Chinese underground, yep. suffer and die, imprisoned. Mm -hmm. Africa, suffer and die. I mean, yeah. so it's there. Right. So it's, and you wonder, but when you meet those people, and I've met them and spoken with them, mm -hmm. sat across the table, they're, yeah. But here's what I don't get, and I don't get it yet because we're not there. The joy and mm -hmm. the privilege yeah. of suffering for the cause of Christ mm -hmm. is amazing. Yeah, that's uh, definitely something that I've noticed with people who've gone through, uh, I mean, I would say actual persecution, the people that you've met, and their demeanor, their spirit, their everything is so full of joy, so full of, of yeah. gratitude towards God. And you're just like, but you went through... All yeah. of this stuff for his yeah. namesake, yeah. and they would say, "Of course I did for his namesake." Yeah. And and it's I just like Ajay Law's prayer when his pastors were being persecuted. Mm -hmm. Don't pray that the persecution will end, but pray that we will be strong enough to endure it, yeah. because this is how the church grows. Yeah. So and that's so true. You know, the church mm -hmm. usually when it's persecuted, it explodes with growth. When it's not, it gets really fat spiritually and lazy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and goes nowhere and becomes nominal. Mm -hmm. Right. All of those things God is aware of. Yeah. Yeah. And yet you you just get to a point where you have to know, according to Matthew 24, mm -hmm. he told you it was coming. Yeah. It's the way the world receives him, unfortunately. Yeah. And there's a there's another world that's wanting to attack and and mm -hmm. and totally mm -hmm. annihilate the Christ follower. Yeah. Yeah. But the gates of Hades will never prevail against right. it. There'll always be God's elect, which means God's all God's people right, right, will right. always be there. Yeah. to continue to take the gospel to the world. And I, I do think it's interesting in that passage because I've heard people say that, well, the, Jesus won't come back until every nation's heard the gospel. And that's right. not quite what that says. Mm -hmm. It talks about until the Gentile world. And quite frankly, we're already there. We were there. Mm -hmm. The Gentile world has heard the gospel. Mm -hmm. And as I, we were talking the other day, if you go to post-Christian Europe think, now, yeah. you got a whole young generation that's never heard the gospel. So mm -hmm. do you start over? Yeah, right. <laughs> so I think we're already past that time that people mm -hmm. have heard the gospel. Yeah. Uh, and the nations have heard the gospel. And it doesn't mean all. It means a significant portion of the world has heard the gospel. Yeah. And that, but that happened a few years ago. You know. Mm. Now we're at the time when it's post-Christian. Yeah. 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 So the gospel is yeah. dissipating. Right. Exactly. And I think that's also prophesied in Matthew 24. There'll be a great falling mm -hmm. away, and that's happened. Yeah. Uh, and now we wait. Yeah. And yeah. We exactly. Watch and we live. Right. Yeah. And uh, I just want to, for our last few sure. minutes, I kind of want to do a shift into what you were talking about of um, how the churches have really been infiltrated by culture. And we're seeing that a lot here, especially now, where how do we as Christ followers discern uh, a healthy church or even a, a good church? And as, as you talked about, the yeah. teachers as well, like how do we discern that? You know, I pray about this all the time because yeah. I'm I'm the old guy now, mm -hmm. you know. And when you're the old guy and you're in a culture, you're in a cancel, cancel culture too. Yeah. So unfortunately, we're at a time when if you say anything negative about anything or anybody, yeah. you're automatically assumed to be a bad person. Yeah. Which means Jesus would have been canceled immediately. <laughs> right. Uh, and so with John the Baptist and the mm -hmm. Apostle Paul. So I think, okay, what is my role here? Because I look back now. I look around and I'm so concerned. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. And I know we're saved by grace through faith. And I know God uses all people. And I ask God all the time, what is my response? Do I have a responsibility to say to the young crowd, don't follow this guy? Right. I've heard this guy enough to know by now. No. Yeah. I'm sure he's a good guy. Maybe he even means well, but you're not getting the gospel here. All you're getting is a Jesus to make you feel good and requires nothing from mm -hmm. you. And then I then I hear a guy who, okay, I like this. This guy talks about what God requires, but the guy's angry all the time. And he's the opposite. I mean, man, why are you so mad? I mean, I don't feel I don't feel any love coming from you. I mean, if you really love me, the way you deliver that to me wouldn't be so angry. You'd yeah. be saying, Look, I love you, but this is you know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking, God, what is my responsibility? Is I I I assume that my responsibility is to not make my whole life about the exposing the false teachers, but yeah. to, to pass on to the next generation, hey, here, mm -hmm. so I try not to throw names out. Right, I just right, say, look, right. here's things you should watch. Right. Watch it when your favorite speaker tells you everything you want to hear. Beware. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Beware of when you're judging your favorite speaker by the way they dress mm. or their charisma. Yeah. And that's the basis on which you judge what you're getting. You're mm. in big trouble. Now, it doesn't mean that if I dress well and I have charisma that I'm wrong. Correct. But don't let that be the determining factor. Right. 
the Bible talks about test everything by mm -hmm. the truth of God's word. Mm -hmm. So try to look past the, the exterior and ask yourself a few questions about whoever it is you're listening to. Is this consistent with good Bible teaching? Do mm -hmm. I even get Bible teaching? Mm -hmm. Or is it a pep rally every time I listen? And is it always about what God wants to give me? Mm -hmm. Is it then then those are the teachers you run from. They're tickling yeah. your ears. You're mm -hmm. not you're not being challenged. Right. And then also these days you've got to look into that person's life. Yeah. How do they live? Now mm -hmm. I'm gonna this is gonna be very unpopular what I'm gonna say. <laughs> right. How do they live? What car do they drive? Yeah. What kind, of how, what kind of home do they live in? Mm -hmm. Do they sacrifice for the kingdom in the way they're asking you to sacrifice for the mm -hmm. kingdom? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Those, are, yeah. those are things you have to do. Right. right. And uh, if you don't do those things, you can very easily be swayed because, because let's face it, we live in a, in, a, in a time when, man, the screen. Yes. You can look so good <laughs> yeah, yeah. on the screen. You know, right. and, oh, man, look. And you, you, can, you can have a power of, uh, all right, let's mention a name because it's after the fact now. Let's mention yeah. Carl Lentz. Yeah, right, right, right. Okay. So you got a guy here who, man, looks good. Mm. Keeps his body in shape, dresses hip. Yeah. You know, and is, is a very effective communicator. Yeah. As I go back and I listen to most of the sermons by Carl, he's not a Bible teacher. Mm. He's a he's a cheerleader. Mm -hmm. He's a rah rah guy, yeah. which there are places for that, but not all the time. Right. Sooner or later, you got to go past this into this. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so, you know, you got to ask yourself a question: How? And, and this is fair to ask, and I'm still going to get bashed for it, but <laughs> it's fair to ask: How can someone stand on the stage and preach and be? be unfaithful to his wife mm -hmm. for so long and still stand up. Yeah. See, I don't think that, I, I just don't see how you can do that. If, if, if the, the, the calling of preaching is a high calling, mm -hmm. there is a high expectation on the way you live your life. Mm -hmm. If you don't like it, too bad. It's yeah. just the way that it is. Right. There's a high calling, high expectation. There's an above reproach expectation. Yeah. You're not going to be perfect. You're going to be human. You're going to fail in some ways. Right. But when you do, confess, repent, and move mm -hmm. on. But if you're able to continue to do that when you're living this duplicitous life over here, mm -hmm. then there's something wrong. So that, that should tell you just because a person is effective on stage, a, a full of charisma, doesn't mean that, that uh, there's a lifestyle that you should be emulating. Right. Oh, 100%. And so you just... That's why we have to let the objective word of God tell us how it mm -hmm. is we should live. No, no one person. That includes me. Right. You, you, you go to the scripture. How mm -hmm. should? How does the Bible? Well, it tells me to be humble. Yeah. Yeah. Tells me not to be prideful. <laughs> mm -hmm. Tells me to be accountable. Yeah. Tells me to be approachable. Tells me to be kind. Tells mm -hmm. me, you know, and you, you may not, you may not be that every moment of every day, but hopefully that's the trajectory of your life. Yeah. Tells you to be faithful to your wife. Mm -hmm. Tells you to be sexually pure. Mm -hmm. And so if if I if I'm not have, if that's not the trajectory of my life, the way the direction my life's moving in, man, that's the, I mean, let's go back to my mentor. Mm -hmm. Okay, it, devastated. So I so the 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 hero small H of my life, Dr. Ravi Zacharias, mm -hmm. mentors me, shapes me. So and so so where do I go with a person who's delivering something that's consistent with the Word of God, but is living a, a yeah. lifestyle that is not consistent. What do I do? Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same. People ask me, were, were you devastated? Did you think about leaving the faith? No, never even crossed my mind. Because yeah. my God is God, right. and it's <laughs> Jesus, no man. Uh -huh. Am I disappointed? Yes. Mm -hmm. Surprised? Yes. But the fact of the matter is, if we put our hope and faith and trust in any person other mm -hmm. than Jesus. So if I've got a person asking me to put my faith and hope and trust in that person, run. Right. Because right, right. <laughs> they'll let you down eventually. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know how to take all of that and put it into one big ball, <laughs> Drew. It's, it's, a, it's a hard thing. But just, right. just if it, you should never put your faith and hope in any one man or woman. Always Correct. put your faith and hope in the Bible and in Jesus. Yeah. And insofar as the person you're listening to or sitting under mm -hmm. effectively communicates the truth of the gospel into your life. And by the way, I think the Holy Spirit will give you warning signs. Correct. I really do. Mm -hmm. I think the Holy Spirit will tell you, you know what, something's off here. Yeah. Oh, 100%. And when you feel that, you need to start to ask questions. Yeah. And yeah. that's of everybody. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's obviously Jesus' warning of yeah. false teachers or of false prophets that are really come in uh, and preach that of self, but dress it up 
in a way where it's like, no, 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 I'm talking about Jesus, but it's like, no, you're actually, you're actually talking about you and, and following you. And, and yeah. um, I think it's important, especially now. I think the way churches are structured matters. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're structured, for instance, you have a group of elders. They are responsible yeah. for the spiritual health and oversight of the mm-hmm. church. So I don't, I'm not the anointed one king who can't be touched. Yeah. I submit to the authorities of our elders. Right. If you're in a church where that there's no submission to authority <laughs> greater than you and you're the anointed one and you you don't have checks and balances, no man or woman is strong enough to endure that. Yeah. yeah. Sooner or later you'll believe your own press clippings. Right. And it always comes out, Drew. It always comes out in the end yeah. that the person who had the great fall had no accountability system. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It oh. always comes out. Yeah. And oh, so that definitely. should be that, that before you sit under someone, you should ask that question. Yeah. What's the accountability structure? Yeah. That's no, that's actually really good to know and, and to really like especially obviously coming out of your message of like the warning signs and and just what to look out for and how to remain faithful in, in the text. And I actually think one of the best examples of um, having discernment and having um, uh, just good insight of going like, okay, I can trust this preacher who, who teaches biblically, who teaches to center yourself on Jesus, not on him, um, was a moment in your message where uh, as you're about to get deep into the text— and you just pause for a second and you say, now this is what the Bible says and this is my viewpoint. And some of you are going to disagree with it. And you said, and that's okay. That's all right. That's, that's huge yeah. right now yeah. because you're, you're telling us that you're not the end all be all. No, this is hard. <laughs> this is the best I can do with it. Yeah. But I'm sure there are teachers in the <laughs> audience this weekend that will say, I don't know, that's not my view. Okay. And yeah, and that's okay. All right. And it's fine. But persecution is still coming no matter what your view is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> False teachers are coming no matter what your yeah. view is. And I think we can all agree on that. So yeah. I don't want people to think, well, that's why I don't trust the Bible because it's up for interpretation. Hold on now. Yeah. The <laughs> message is there, very clear, 2,000 years, yeah. same message. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are some uh, places in the Bible that are very difficult to understand how they relate to the future. Yeah. But hey, I think we're okay. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we still be brothers. Uh-huh. <laughs> exactly. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although for some, that may not be a possibility. <laughs> yeah, that is very That's true. That's when we really start missing the mark, by the yes. way. Yeah. Oh, 100%. So anyway, I, I, know, I know our time is limited, but yeah. I, I, I want to give a message to that to this mm-hmm. generation. I'm so happy that they're on fire for Jesus mm-hmm. and they're, they want to do what's right and they want to be, they want to live lives of holiness and distinction yeah. and they want to take the good news of the world. Mm-hmm. Just be careful who you sit under. Uh-huh. Make no mistake, whoever you sit under will influence you. Yeah. But what goes in will influence. So yeah. be wise. Yeah. Just stick to Jesus. Yeah. Stick to Jesus, man. <laughs> he works every time. Every time. That's good. <laughs>